there was a world of the dead beneath the ground, under our feet, which was upside down seen with our eyes. The roots of our trees formed the trees of the dead. The dead walked with their feet pressed against ours. Our fish were their birds. Some beings can travel between the different worlds, such as the Koyat, the little ones. The little ones told me that we were cousins, but that humans had forgotten their magic a long time ago. They said that we used to live amongst fire and earth and air and water, and that our spirits were nourished by them, just like theirs are. Now, they say, we lock ourselves up in boxes stacked on top of one another, away from all other living things. They've been around a very long time. Some of those who saw us before we forgot our magic are still alive. My little ones are very little ones. They say a few hundred years, about my age. One day the little ones and I were playing together and they told me how all their elders had travelled from the world of the living to the world of the dead. The journey is a rite of passage. When you are old and wise enough, you make the jump. Are you not scared, Biavi? asked Manu. No. I would make the jump right now if I wanted to, replied Biavi. No, you wouldn't. You're not wise enough yet. You wouldn't get very far and you certainly wouldn't get back. Children are far wiser than grown-ups, Manu. I could see they were teasing each other at first, but after that they both went silent. They often have unspoken conversations that I'm not a part of as I suppose all best friends do. After this particular silence, they told me how they were going to make the jump with excitement and mischief in their voices. I wished I could have gone too, but I am far too big to make the jump, and they assured me they would come back with endless stories to tell me. After the jump, there was darkness. But soon Biavi found herself alone in colour, hers, her beautiful golden sun dust. The first realm, as all little ones know, is the realm of light. Biavi was delighted to find the light was her colour. She breathed a sigh smile and happily exclaimed, Light is gold. Light is not gold, shouted Manu from somewhere in the darkness. Light is the deepest blue. Biavi peered out into the darkness, but she could not see him or anything other than her beautiful golden yellow. You're definitely wrong, she called back playfully. They argued like this for some time, but eventually got bored and decided to try and find each other. They both closed their eyes and began to sing their soul songs, which were so perfectly in harmony with one another. They followed each other's songs until they were standing side by side. They opened their eyes and found themselves surrounded in the most beautiful life-giving green. They looked around in amazement, then looked back at each other. Manu took Biavi's hand and led her through the changing shades to the most beautiful deep blue, although Biavi did not think it as beautiful as his own unique shade. After bathing in the depths of this deep blueness, they walked on and slowly came to redness, and beyond until Biavi had returned home to her most beautiful golden yellow, although Manu did not think it as beautiful as her own unique shade. It was only once they had each stood where the other had stood that they began to see their truth. To pass through the different realms, you have to know or discover the highest truths, not just in mind, but in heart too. They sat in silence, in feeling and thought. You know what's funny, said Manu. What? 
It's funny that all the colours never end. None finish or begin. We could keep walking forever. They looked out at their never-ending horizons. They're all shades of one, said Piavi. We are all shades of one, said Mana. At that moment they looked up and saw their truth. Pure light shone above them. There was all the colours in one. The star is full of sun. They followed the star which led Manu home to his deepest blue and there beneath them slept a sea of dazzling darkness. Upon the shore, a golden walnut shell awaited them, and away into the darkness they sailed. When the little ones arrived in the realm of water, they began playing amongst the snowflakes in a time that seemed timeless. They watched as the sky turned from indigo to gold over the glistening white. They watched the shadows change colours until all the rainbows trapped in snow tears turned to grey. In the morning they were met by the sun climbing the mountains behind them and they walked towards the day. They found themselves in a small village between two mountains. It wasn't long until mischief was inspired in them and they began tying their little slaves to more extravagant horse-drawn ones so that they could fly through the air faster than snowflakes are born. Manu, with an eager smile in his eyes, tied his sleigh to the largest in the village, drawn by six horses that were whiter than snow. As soon as the knot was tight, away he flew and Biavi was left alone. His sleigh was now tied to the sleigh of the Snow Queen, she and Manu flew through the sky storms gracefully. She pulled him onto her sleigh and fear froze him. Her eyes cut through his, as they were in fact shards of broken glass forged into flowers. Her dress was the artwork of Jack Frost himself. She kissed him, and as she did, ice crystals formed around his heart. people in the village kept saying that Manu was more than likely drowned in the river. So Biavi went to her friend the river to ask if this was true. The river told her it was not, and that she could help Biavi find her way. So she climbed into the golden walnut shell and soon fell asleep in the arms of the river. Biavi awoke to find herself washed up on the golden shores of a strange island in the middle of the deep blue sky. She walked away from the water's edge in search of Manu, and came to the most beautiful garden she had ever seen. She felt the softest pillows of moss beneath her, and the silent silk blankets of stars above her and all around the life-giving green shone the deepest indigo flowers that caused ripples of Manu in the still centre of her being. In the middle of the garden there sat an old woman. Biavi told this woman her story, in the hope that she could help her find her way. But by the time Biavi was done, the woman had taken such a liking to her that she did not want her to leave. She cast a magic spell, for she was in fact a witch, to make Biavi forget Manu. Everything that was of his colour disappeared. Even in the sky there was no memory of blue. After darkness started to fall, the old woman let her head fall with it into her pillows of dream-kissing moss. But as her head fell, Biavi caught a glance at the beautiful indigo flower the old woman had pinned to her hat and forgotten all about. At that moment, Piavi remembered everything and ran to her little golden walnut shell as fast as she could. She thanked her friend the river at sunrise and continued on her own. She walked through forests of purple trees, along mountain ranges painted against skies of burning emeralds. When she finally climbed down, she found herself in a desert of water. 
She followed the floating sand dunes until the water turned to ice. Ice crystals grew into shards of broken glass the closer she came to the castle and the dead horizon. Silently, so silently, she tiptoed into the Snow Queen's palace. There, in the middle of a vast blue ice crystal chamber sat Manu all alone. Manu, Biavi cried with joy. Manu looked up at Biavi for the first time in the longest time they had ever been apart and spoke the words, who are you? It's me, Biavi, you don't remember. We were born from the same rock. You are the colour closest to dark, and I the colour closest to light, and we're the best of friends. We made this jump together and we have to go on together, otherwise we can never go home. This is my home. Biavi could not believe it. She felt the blinding agony of grief form in her core. She choked as tears flooded from her. She held Manu fiercely and wept and wept. And as her tears fell onto him, they melted the ice crystals around his heart. Suddenly, Manu came awake in love. They flew into the night, back to their old friend the river who was waiting for them with their little golden walnut shell. They climbed inside and the river cradled them as they fished for stars in the deep blue sky beneath them and flung them into the sky above them to light their way. The stars keep falling out of the sky, Manu. I don't think they're falling. I think someone is catching them. They saw on the horizon a black silhouette of a girl dancing and swirling and casting her fishing line into the sky, painting it in golden star swords. They followed her sky paintings through waters and trees until they found her. Why are you catching our stars? demanded Biavi. Do you know where you're going? asked the starfisher. Manu and Biavi shook their heads. Well, your stars won't know if you don't. She looked up into the sky. We're going to the realm of the dead, said Biavi. But we don't know exactly how to get there. The starfish had turned to them and said, When I was a child, I would dance along the shores of Afaron, the island of the Ferald. There was a temple on the island, and it held within it a thousand bells. Big bells and small bells. Bells made by the most skillful artists in all the worlds. When the winds danced, or the nights stormed, the bells would breathe and burst into symphony. It would drown the heart of the listener into nirvana. I would feel the rain, and the song of the bells would flood my skin as I danced and danced. But as time passed, the mountains crumbled. The island sank beneath the sea, and with it the temple. But do not be disheartened, for the bells continue to sing ceaselessly to the sea, and can be heard by anyone willing to listen. This is where you must go if you wish to reach the realm of the dead. Here, this will guide your way. She pulled a star from her pocket and threw it into the sky. Biavi and Manu travelled for days and nights. They saw many colours and landscapes and creatures along the way. Eventually, 
They sat for days on the shore, watching the waves play over where the island once stood. They listened every day with all their might, but could only hear the crashing breaths of the sea. Every night they would fall into sleep, dreaming of what the bells might sound like. In the morning they would continue to try and block out the sound of the sea, but the sound would flood the world no matter what efforts they made. Despite this, they kept to their task for weeks. Every time they became disheartened, the ferret would assure them that the bells could be heard by anyone willing to listen. They would return to their task with renewed enthusiasm, only to be discouraged again after further weeks passed and no bells were heard. Finally, they decided to give up, to try and find their way back to the starfisher. Biavi and Manu went to the shore to make their goodbyes to the sea and the sun and the sky, whom had become home and friends to them. They lay on the sand and for the first time listened to the song of the sea. They breathed with the waves, spiraling in and out and in and out. Soon they were so lost in the ocean's song that they were barely conscious of themselves. They saw her then, the starfisher, dancing along their breath into the ocean. So deep was the silence that sound created. In the depth of that silence they heard it, the shimmering call of a tiny bell, followed by another and another and another. And soon every one of those thousand temple bells was singing and chanting and roaring and laughing and crying. so beautiful that the little ones began falling into love itself. They fell and kept falling. Through shapes and patterns and sounds they had never experienced before and yet seemed so familiar. Inside a spiral they found a tree, under which sat an old woman. She spoke fiercely like a dragon guarding treasure. Do you know what Arwen is? They looked down at their shoes and did not answer for they did not know. The woman forced their stare into her eyes and asked again, Do you know what Arwen is? No, they whispered in unison, and they could see in her eyes that she knew. Okay, she said, do you want to know? They looked intently into her eyes and let their silence speak their truest yes. She smiled and said, do you know how this huge tree came to be? From a seed, answered Biavi. Can you pluck me a fruit? She asked. Let's take a look at the seed. So Manu plucked a fruit from the tree and broke it open. And inside it lay the sleeping seeds. He pulled one out and handed it to the woman. She looked at it for a while and then back at them and said, Do you mean to say that this huge, great tree has come from that little seed? They nodded. But then, what is the secret inside the seed? She gave it to Biavi and told her to break it open. Biavi did as she said, only to find nothing. I cannot see anything, she said. The old woman looked intently into them both. From that void, from that apparent nothingness, this huge tree has emerged. From that void, you and I and all has emerged. You are that, Koyat.
I never thought of my ancestors as being important as I never knew them. But when the little ones spoke of them, it made something in me love them deeply. They walk with their feet pressed against ours. The little ones said it was like nature. Nature makes one part out of another and creates the most diverse forms of one. The ancestor of the acorn is a tree. Who knows where I come from? Or I will one day be.